Hello, welcome to Strategy in Future. My name is Jacek Bartosiak, and today my guest is Hugh White, a p- 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 outstanding Australian strategist. Hello, Hugh. <laughs> nice to be with you, Jacek. Uh, okay, so how, how is the situation in Australia? How do you feel these days uh, in terms of pandemic and China thing and all this turmoil that, that we can see and the elections in the United States? Well, there's a lot of things going on. I mean, to just look at the pandemic first, we in Australia have been less seriously affected by the disease itself than than many other countries, not unaffected, but the infection rates have been relatively low. Um, Death rates have been relatively low, but that's come at the cost of very significant disruption to our economy. So we've had a recession in Australia for the first time since the early 1990s. Australia has had a record run of economic growth, which has now come to an end, and the government finances have been transformed with massive uh, deficits flowing from really large-scale um, attempts to keep the economy going, and we still don't know how we're going to get out of that. Um, and uh, uh, like everyone else, we've been watching what's been happening in the United States. I think we're uh, pleased that Donald Trump didn't get re-elected, disappointed that he wasn't rejected more decisively by the American electorate. The fact that such a significant proportion of American voters, 70 million of those who bothered to go out and vote in the United States still thought they'd vote for Donald Trump, having seen what kind of a president he was, is, is remains a bit alarming. Um, and although I don't doubt, and I think most Australians wouldn't doubt that Biden will be a much better president both for America and for America's friends and allies than Donald Trump was, um, uh, there's not much confidence that he's really got what it takes to address America's enormous challenges domestically, or at least in my case, I don't think uh, there's much chance that he has what's going to be required to address America's challenges internationally, and including especially the challenges that America faces in Asia from, from China. And that's, you know, that's obviously a huge, uh, a huge issue for us. And on top of that, of course, there's the fact that depending on what happens in the supplemental elections in Georgia, uh, he's unlikely to be controlling the Senate. Um, and so there's his capacity to really introduce a lot of the ch- changes that he talks about introducing, I think, are quite, are quite modest. I think one's got to be pleased by the outcome of the election, but, but pessimistic about how far Biden is going to be able to turn America back into the sort of country that America's friends and allies would like it to be. And the last thing for Australia, and in many ways the thing that looms largest for us, is the way in which our relationship with China has slid into crisis this year. Um, it's it, In some ways it's been quite a steady process and it didn't just start this year. You could say that, that Australia's relationship with China um, started going cold in 2017 um, with some measures that were taken by the government under the previous Prime Minister. Um, But this year, for reasons that are a little bit hard to pin down, under Scott Morrison, our present Prime Minister, who had hitherto been fairly careful not to take steps that would irritate China, uh, he he started uh, doing things and saying things uh, which have really irritated China. China is hit back very hard, making very overt, very bullying threats of economic retaliation. Some of those threats have been carried out. There's significant effects on Australia's trade with uh, with China across a whole range of important commodities. Um, and that really matters to Australia because China is by far our biggest trading partner. Uh, for us today, but I guess like many other countries, it's a, a very significant source of future economic opportunities for Australia to to, re, to revive its economy after the pandemic. We're going to need uh, export opportunities. We're a very export-oriented economy, and China is partly because of its scale and partly because of its uh, the fact that it's continued to grow so strongly compared to other countries as it comes out of the pandemic. China's our main source of future economic opportunity. So the fact that that our, our diplomatic positioning has has generated these ructions with China, the fact that China is responding so in such a bullying fashion, 
that, that has meant that our relationship with China is now the worst place that it's been since we established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic uh, back in 1972. And we have a, um, uh, and no, nobody can see daylight ahead. Nobody can see how the, um, uh, how the relationship with China can be t turned around and, and picked up. And that's become a, a really major preoccupation in Australia. It's very difficult to assess things from far away uh, as seen from Europe. Uh, but what happened to Morrison that he changed his posture and suddenly he, he started criticizing? Was there any currency, uh, you know, in that, in terms of, you know, what was he, was promised by the Americans to, to get something in exchange? Well, then what was the help look, of the U.S. afterwards? Yeah, look, it's an interesting question. I, I don't believe so. Certainly there was a lot of encouragement from Washington mm -hmm. and from the Trump administration for Australia to be tough on China. And, um, and tougher on China than we had been. Uh, Australia's record on this is a little bit mixed. People often see Australia as being very closely aligned with the United States, and of course it is. It's a very close ally, and Australian political leaders are apt to make very broad uh, comments about the depth of our alliance and our commitment to, to remaining very closely committed to supporting the United States. But the fact is that ever since the US declared China to be a strategic rival in the national security strategy back in 2017, Australia has in fact been very reluctant to follow America down that path. So no Australian political leader has ever uh, described China as a strategic rival, has ever, uh, has ever uh, echoed and endorsed that US formulation. Um, and uh, uh, Morrison himself went, has often gone to a lot of trouble um, to, to, to say that Australia does not share that perspective, that does not see China as a strategic rival. And so um, although Australia has, and in other ways, for example, Australia has supported the United States in its postures in the South China Sea, but it has resisted US pressure to join the United States in undertaking freedom of navigation operations in the South China Sea. Uh, and last year, uh, when uh, Secretary of Defence Espers was in, was in Australia uh, soon after the formal abrogation of the INF Treaty, uh, there was a clear attempt by the US side, by Espers, to raise the idea that the US might base intermediate range ballistic missiles in Australia as part of a broader posture uh, to build up its position in relation to China. And the Australian government repudiated that very quickly, made it very clear that it was not interested in pursuing that question. So there's all sorts of ways in which Australia has been, notwithstanding our rhetorical um, commitment to the alliance, has been rather slow in actually offering concrete support to the United States as the United States has attempted to really put a, a, a flesh out the diplomatic and military components of its, um, you know, strategic rivalry with China. So uh, I, I think there has been some pressure from the United States for Australia to do a bit more, but I don't believe that's what's that's what pushed Morrison uh, to be more assertive towards China this year. I think actually what pushed him to do it was domestic politics. Um, this is a slightly cynical view of the way things have unfolded in Australia, but I think the evidence supports it quite strongly. Morrison is not a big strategic thinker. He's a practical day-to-day -day retail politician, and he responds very rapidly to shifts in public opinion. Uh, he had a bad summer, Australian summer, last year. We had catastrophic bushfires, which he was largely seen as having mishandled. And so when the pandemic arose, uh, uh, he was again under pressure as to how well to respond. And I think he saw standing up to China, being um, pugnacious towards China, as being an opportunity to extract some of the political advantages which Trump extracted in America from being seen to be strong in standing up for America's interests and values and identity. And for that matter, there's a bit of Brexit about it too. The way in which... Uh, British politicians have found themselves, like Johnson, um, building their public position on the basis of being strong defenders of Britain against all these interfering, inter interfering foreigners in Europe. Um, 
there was a there was a quite a lot of that. So Morrison used ideas of sovereignty and standing up for Australia's identity. Just last week, he said, you know, Australia must be Australian. And I, I think what Morrison was trying to do was to win some short-term political benefits, recover from some of the difficulties he faced over the summer, by suddenly being much more pugnacious, much more assertive towards China than he has been before. And the Chinese understood this. They didn't like to see their relationship with Australia, uh, with China, politicised in this way. And so they immediately hit back very hard. And they immediately, back all the way back in March and April, started threatening Australian trade and saying, if you start doing these sorts of things. For example, Morrison called publicly and in a very um, aggressive way for a uh, for an international inquiry into the origins of the pandemic. And he did it in terms which clearly indicated that he thought China was responsible. And the Chinese hit back very hard. They were very resistant to that. Um, and, and so, of course, once the Chinese started threatening Australia, uh, Australian trade, uh, Morrison found that he was even more popular by presenting himself as the sort of little David standing up to the big Goliath. And so it has worked well for him politically, um, at least until the last few months, last couple of months and a few weeks in particular, where the scale of China's trade retaliation is starting to become clear and people are really starting to worry about what it's going to mean for our economy. So I think that's changed, that's turned around a bit. So that it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, there's been a been quite a lot of domestic politics about it and the tragedy for Australia is that it is true we have big problems with China. China is a different kind of country than any we've ever encountered before. It's the first time since European settlement of this continent, which is of course right on the edge of Asia, very much in the Asian world, uh, first time since European settlement that we've, we've encountered an Asian country as powerful as China. And we've always felt we've been able to rely on Anglo-Saxon powers like Britain first during the British Empire and then America since the Second World War to, to dominate Asia and to keep us safe. And we, we don't feel we can rely on them anymore. And so there's a very real challenge for us in working out how we build this relationship with China. And in a sense, what we're seeing at the moment is in the, in the complexities is the difficulties Australia faces in working out how to manage this new kind of relationship. It's a pr problem that people in Poland understand very well how does a middle-sized power deal with great powers, but there's something for Australia that we're still coming to terms with. Uh, and uh, what, what does the business community say? Uh, what, yeah. what does the political life look like in that respect? Is it being you know, influenced by, by business elites? Circles well, well, no, it's a really interesting question. Most, most of the time, Australian business elites like to be very apolitical. They just don't like to get involved in these discussions. And I think uh, uh, Australian business has taken it for granted that Australian governments would never do anything to endanger a relationship as important as a relationship with China. So they've been shocked and surprised by the kinds of things that have happened. Um, and uh, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, the politics of this has started to turn around. Earlier in the year, the Australian public was broadly supportive of Morrison being seen to be standing up for Australia against the bullying Beijing. But in the last few weeks, as the scale of Chinese retaliation against Australia has become clearer, um, there's been some widespread and very unusual, really for the first time, we've seen the senior business leaders in Australia criticising the government for mismanaging the relationship with China um, and calling on Morrison to, to start managing it more adroitly to avoid these sorts of problems. And uh, so I think, you know, there is starting to be some, some political pushback. Um, it's not quite clear how Morrison is going to handle that, whether he's going to be able to find a way through it. He has two kind of approaches that he's running at the moment. One is that he's trying to distance Australia from America. He gave a big speech to a UK audience earlier this week in which he said um, that, in which he emphasised that Australia's attitudes towards China weren't dictated by the United States. He seems to think that the reason why the, why the Chinese are, are putting pressure on us is they see us as a stalking horse for America. I'm sure that's partly true, but I think he underestimates the extent that the Chinese are also responding to what he himself has done. The other thing he's done is trying to reassure Australians that we're not alone, that we can that we can marginalise China, isolate China by drawing closer to other countries in the region. And so last week, again, 
he took the remarkable step under the circumstances of going himself to Japan. This is the first overseas trip he's taken since the pandemic struck. Um, he's the first foreign leader to visit Japan since the new Prime Minister Suga was, was, uh, was installed. Um, and he went there specifically to sign a very low-level defence agreement, an agreement about how our forces can use one another's bases. But he hailed that, he presented that agreement as a sort of major new alliance for Australia. And the aim was to show that, you know, we can, we can work with other countries like Japan, we can push back against the Chinese with all these other countries supporting us. I, I personally think that's just wrong. Um, the, the, the fact is that Japan is taking a very different approach to China from us. Japan has been very careful about dealing with the Chinese. And just this week, just a few days after Morrison was in Beijing, that with Morrison was in Tokyo, uh, the Chinese foreign minister, Wang Yi, was in Tokyo, setting up arrangements for a visit to Tokyo, which had been scheduled for this year and is now being rescheduled for next year, by Xi Jinping. Now, the idea of Xi Jinping visiting Australia is, uh, with the press and atmospherics is just unthinkable. So the fact that Japan, for all of the really deep problems that Japan has with China, is managing the relationship in such a way that a visit by Xi Jinping is, you know, being scheduled, shows how much Australia is alone, how differently other countries in, hand, in Asia are handling this problem. And so, you know, I think Morrison, as he faces growing political pressure in Australia because of the real concern about the economic implications or the way the relationship is being mishandled, is, uh, is, is starting to have second thoughts, but it's not too clear how he can dig himself out of the hole he's dug, he's dug himself into. Uh, last time we talked, it was before the pandemic, and yes. uh, uh, you had you, you, you've been writing books, uh, uh, basically describing the world that is that was coming upon us, uh, where the United States would not be capable of uh, guaranteeing the, the security. Uh, what has the pandemic changed in your uh, thinking? Uh, it's a really interesting question, Jacek. I, I think I think there are three ways in which it's it's changed my thinking, and and just to uh, uh, just to foreshadow what I'm about to say, none of it's good news. Um, the the first thing is I think that it's it's accelerated the shift in in power and influence between Washington and Beijing. You know, part of my argument for a long time has been that um, that uh, the shift the shift in power and influence between Washington and Beijing has been faster than many other people have understood, uh, economically, militarily, diplomatically. Uh, it's not that um, people like China more. Um, they don't, but they understand its power and, and, and are willing to respond to it. And I think the pandemic has accelerated that and done that in two ways. The first is economically. Um, it's clear that the economic impact in in America is much greater than in China because the, um, because the, well, I think for two reasons, partly because of the policy response, but also because of the severity of the pandemic itself. The Chinese have just managed the pandemic better. And that's, and so the, so the, so the, the, the speed with which China is catching up with and overtaking the United States has accelerated. And I think that's fundamental to the shift in the distribution of wealth and power and therefore in America's capacity to preserve its position. The second is that I think the, uh, the US has suffered, obviously, a very significant reputational damage. That um, the fact that it has handled the pandemic so badly, the fact that China, whatever its responsibility for the original outbreak, has managed it so well, um, uh, does, uh, I think, undermine America's claims uh, to a comp competence and effectiveness, which have been important to its credentials as a leader. And so I think, you know, the first thing is that that shift in distribution of wealth and power and, and influence has, has accelerated in China's, in China's favour. The second is, uh, I think it's, it's reduced even further uh, the willingness of Americans to bear the burdens and pay the price of global leadership. Um, obviously, this has been a bad year for America in all kinds of ways. Uh, the, 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 the racial tensions and so on, uh, the pandemic, the economic consequences, the uncertainties, the constitutional uncertainties um, that were created by the way 
Trump approached the, the election, the way he's approached the transition since his, since his loss. Um, and I think there is still, you know, we still don't quite know how the Republican side, the Trump side of American politics is going to respond to a Biden presidency. So I think there's a real, um, uh, I think that, that this has not been a good year for America. And I think the, the capacity of, of, of leaders, any leader in America, to mobilise Americans to bear the burdens and and take the and accept the risks, pay the costs of a strategic of maintaining its strategic primacy globally, of being prepared to push back and effectively manage the challenge that faces in the Middle East, in Europe, from Russia, of course, and for, and in Asia, from from China, uh, I think has been been diminished. And the, the, third, the third thing is that I think it's made, um, at least in, in the case of Asia, I think it's made China more confident. Um, I, think, I think that this has been a good year for China despite the pandemic, partly because of the two factors I've just mentioned. But I think China is, will, will have emerged from this year um, more confident that it can push America back therefore more willing to take risks. I think we can see that, for example, over the way they've been conducting themselves in Hong Kong uh, and, in the, and in what they've been doing around Taiwan. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I'm one of those who sees the situation around Taiwan as pretty worrying, and it's partly because the Chinese have been, I think, quite deliberately turning up the pressure on Taiwan. Uh, partly that's been a response to things that Americans have done, but I think they've also... China has gone further than they would would, would earlier have done, and uh, and I think that's um, one of the reasons for that is that I, I I think the Chinese will find Biden an easier president to deal with than Trump. It's not that Trump was not as bad for China as it appears in many ways, because although his administration talked a lot about strategic rivalry and so on, Trump himself didn't. But the risk, I think, that the Chinese faced with Trump was that he was so erratic. Um, and when you're trying to do what China's doing, which is pushing and trying to push America hard enough to get it to step back from Asia, but not so hard that it bites back by starting a conflict, um, when it's trying to use uh, tensions and standoffs in places like the South China Sea or over Taiwan as a way of asserting and promoting its leadership and undermining America's, then there's always a risk that your adversary will respond irrationally. And the risk of an irrational response from Trump was very high. Biden, I think, is a much more cautious, orderly, disciplined, responsible policymaker and is therefore much less likely to take America into a conflict with China on a whim. And Biden himself is, um, despite his occasional tough language on China, is is not a hawk. He's a, he's a dove. He was even in the Obama administration, which was a very dovish administration. He was the guy that was even more reluctant to use armed force than Barack Obama was. And so I think from Beijing's point of view, um, they now feel that they're facing an, uh, a, a rival in the White House who is going to be easier to predict and less likely to respond to Chinese provocations in Asia. And that therefore strengthens China's position at the same time as for the other reasons I just sketched, I think America's position is weakened. So I think for, for those of us who would like to see America remain the dominant power in Asia, I don't think it's been a good year. And I think some of the same factors, some of the same factors relate to Europe too, I might say. Um, uh, although, of course, the peculiar chemistry of Trump's relationship with Putin is uh, one of the things that's passed. Yeah, and I have two questions that would uh, uh, sort of navigate around the same, the same topic. Uh, how would, if you were Biden, okay, how would you react to the rise of China given the pandemic and the, you know, the quickly changing correlation of power and distribution of power? What would be the grand strategy that you would pursue? And the second well, thing is, and the, if, if I may, and the second yeah, thing yes. is, uh, in your in your book, uh, how to defend Australia, you were just proposing certain things, and Morrison uh, uh, initiated this program of boosting military spending more. Is it in line with what you were writing in details in the book, or yeah. going sideways? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Look, um, two really good questions. Um, look. 
it's a really interesting question. You know, what what should, what should Biden do? I, I think the, the first step in any grand strategy is to identify what your objectives are. And you have to, def- and you have to identify your objectives by making a, a prudent and sober assessment of the costs and risks involved. Now, America's objective, very much taken for granted across the political and policy spectrum in Washington, America's objective is to preserve its position as the leading power in Asia. But I think that objective has been adopted without deep reflection, uh, um, and in particular, without reflecting on the costs and risks involved. Um, It's been assumed that China is going to be easy to defeat, that, uh, that this new Cold War is going to be easy to win. Uh, and I think, and I think that's wrong. So the first thing Biden needs to do is to make a careful assessment of what's really going to be required to win this new Cold War, and how much is that going to cost, and are those costs worth it? Now, the argument that I've made in the in the past, and several of the things I've published, including in a brief form in the How to Defend Australia book, is that when America soberly assesses uh, the costs of of trying to impose, continue to impose American leadership on China in China's own backyard at a time when China's economy is bigger than America's and when China's military capability, though still smaller than America's overall, has grown enormously in its capacity to impose costs and risks on America. The costs to to, to America are going to be very high indeed. Uh, This really is a new Cold War in that respect. Uh, and, and, uh, And I think when those costs and risks are properly understood, um, then I think it's it's clear that America should only run those costs and risks if it's really most vital interests are engaged. So the second thing that Biden has to do is to ask, well, how much does it really matter to America to preserve that leadership in Asia? What's at stake for America? Now, in, in America itself, in, in Washington, in the policy and political s- circles, it's broadly assumed that America has to prevent China dominating East Asia in order for America to remain secure itself. And there is an analogy here with the Cold War, that that in the Cold War, America had to stop the Soviet Union dominating Eurasia in order to avoid the Soviet Union being able to challenge America, threaten America at home in the Western Hemisphere. And there's a kind of assumption that if China can dominate East Asia, then it can dominate Eurasia. And if it can dominate Eurasia, it can threaten America. I think that's wrong. This is one of the ways in which this is not like the Cold War is that during the Cold War, particularly in its earlier phases, the Soviet Union really was poised to dominate Eurasia if it hadn't been contained uh, because the rest of Eurasia was very weak. Europe, of course, was well, it dominated the eastern part of Europe already from 1945. Western Europe was very weak, uh, very fragmented, um, uh, devastated by the, by the Second World War. India was just post-colonial and very weak and fragmented and, uh, and had very strong communist leading. Southeast Asia was very, was very fragile and so on. Um, that, was a, that was a region that America, that, uh, that the Soviet Union could have dominated. But China is not going to find it nearly as easy as the Soviets would have to dominate Eurasia. Uh, it's got Russia for a start, which for all its peculiarities remains a very formidable power. It's got India today, which is a very different kind of power. It's got Europe which for all its idiosyncrasies remains, it seems to me, inherently strategically very formidable. Huge population, huge economy, very deep technological resources. And of course, what one might call military traditions going back many centuries. Um, I'm not one of those who thinks that the, uh, that the Europeans are from Venus. Um, there's plenty of Mars in Europe um, in, and in many of Europe's nations. Now, of course, whether, whether Europe can, can function as a strategic unit is an interesting question. Hasn't done so yet, but I have a feeling that it will if it has to. Um, so for all of those reasons, I don't think China threatens to dominate Eurasia, even if it does dominate East Asia. I therefore don't think China dominating East Asia would threaten America. And I therefore don't think there's a very strong strategic argument for America to bear the burdens and accept the risks that can, that, that resist, that. Um, uh, preventing China dominating East Asia would pose. So Biden has to has to work through that argument. Maybe he'll come to different conclusions from from me. Okay, if so, he has to present those conclusions. That's what that's what a modern day X article 
would do. That's what today's George Kennan needs to do, is to make that argument. Why is it so important to America to do this? And, and I, don't think he can, I don't think he can do that. A and if he can't, if he, if he reaches that conclusion, then he should step back from the contest because it would be nothing more foolish than to drive America into an escalating strategic rival, rivalry where the country is powerful and dangerous as China, unless America's vital interests really require it. And, you know, most, if, if, I, if I said what I've just said to you to my many old friends and colleagues in Washington, the first thing they'd say is, but we have to do this because we have these alliances, to which I say, no, alliances are not an interest in themselves. They're an instrument to serve your interests. And if America's own vital interests don't require it to preserve its leadership position in Asia, then the fact that it has alliances in Asia will, will not suffice. They, 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 in, they, in the end, will end up being a victim of this process. And for that reason, I think if and when Biden does undertake that, that kind of analysis I've just described, he will conclude that America should step back from the contest. If he doesn't, then America won't step back from the contest, but it will not but it will not put the effort in, will not pay the costs, will not prosecute the rivalry with China vigorously enough to win it. And therefore, by some process, it might be slow and gradual, it might be fast and tragic, America will end up losing. Um, and it's better to step back from a conflict if you're, or from a competition if you're not going to win it. Sure, sure. I, I, before we conclude, I Sorry, will... I, I, I'll, I, 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 I should just answer your question on defence policy. Yeah, I'll yeah, do yeah. it very brief. I'll do it very briefly. M M Morrison did something important in the middle of this year, in July this year, when he announced a new uh, strategic defence update. Uh, and in announcing it, he he gave a very grim picture of the strategic situation in Asia. He said that the situation we face today is comparable to the situation we faced in the early 1930s, and that the risk of major conflict has increased substantially. He then went on to claim that he'd very substantially increased Australia's defence spending in order to respond to this increased threat. That was untrue. Uh, he didn't increase Australian defence spending uh, and nor did he change the, the structure of the Australian Defence Force. He, he, Australia is, the policy announced basically continues to spend, broadly speaking, the same amount of money, some minor increases at the margins, but you know, a few billion out of hundreds of billions over a decade. Uh, and and on the same kind of things, and uh, and, and so I, I and and the, and the kind of forces that he's talking about building, and the implied military strategy that those forces suggest he's adopting, are very different from the ones that I proposed. They they continue to focus very strongly on Australia trying to project a power uh, uh, over over mar by, by maritime means around East Asia which I think is something that's foolish for us to try to do because I don't think we'll succeed. Uh, it doesn't focus on optimising our capacity to prevent others projecting power against us. So um, although I give Morrison credit for having acknowledged how, how sharply Australia's strategic circumstances have declined, uh, I, do, I don't think he's begun to do enough to respond to that effectively. Yeah, be, before I, I uh, uh, permit myself to ask you the last question and conclude our conversation, I have two comments to what you were saying yes. about the, um, America and Biden. Uh, I often notice that Americans are are having this hubris, you know, this feeling that they are really in control of the situation in East Asia and globally, and they have such a lead uh, in relation to China that actually they can do whatever they want, and, um, uh, and that uh, that always uh, keeps me uh, scared about escalatory path. Hmm. Uh, let alone that, um, as opposed to Cold War with Soviet Union, where it was only about security, and here there is more also of trade, strategic flows. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It will have to be a heavy rollback, not only containment, hmm. which hmm. is highly escalatory, right? And yeah. there are no boundaries right now uh, yeah. drawn as it was in 1945, where the troops were stationed, Soviet troops and American troops. I mean, it was easy and everybody did the best to, to avoid war. Now it would have to impose a heavy rollback in yes. all places where China, where China is making progress uh, commercially, technologically, you know, Huawei market and so on. 
So it will always be seen as a breaking of the social contract of China and undermining the yes. ruling party. Uh, yes. This is why I'm, I'm, I'm scared even more uh, after or during this pandemic as it sort of may accelerate the showdown. And I uh, hear from Washington that they're really bent to really confront China all the yes. way. Uh, yes. So th these are, were my comments from the other side of the world. Yeah. Uh, and, and my last question is, uh, sorry for those philosophical questions that are not easy to answer probably, uh, but I really trust your uh, expertise uh, always and all, I'm always attentive to what you're saying. What would you uh, expect Biden to do? Because we discussed what yes, he yes, should be yes, doing, yes, what he, yes, you think would be yes, grand strategy. Yes. But yes. now realize, yeah. what he, yeah. will he do? What do you think? Yeah. What is your prediction? Yeah, no, really good question, Jessica. And just to say, I very much agree with the reflections you've just made, uh, both about American overconfidence and about the difficulties and dangers of the contest as it's now formulated. As you say, it's a very broad contest and very hard to conclude satisfactorily. So what do I expect Biden to do? I'm a, I'm, as you'll have gathered, I'm a basically a pessimistic kind of a guy. And so I don't think I don't think Biden will undertake the kind of serious fundamental strategic assessment that I just suggested he should do. I think what's much more likely is that uh, America, Washington will continue to um, pr 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 promote a strategic contest with China, but do far too little to win it. And that's really what we've seen consistently, really, ever since President Obama announced the pivot in 2010. He, of course, he didn't call China a strategic rival, but it was clear that the pivot, 2011, it was clear that the pivot was, um, you know, an, an attempt to push back against China's challenge to American leadership in Asia. And, 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 and the fate of the pivot was that, it, was that it failed because America didn't put anything like the resources behind it. Now, in 20, after 2017, after the national security strategy of 2017 declared China as a strategic rival, what one should have expected would be a vastly increased effort, much more American resources going into this in, into the attempt to push back against China. And what we've seen is nothing of the kind. America has not committed resources anything like commensurate with what would be required, and and, and military, diplomatic, financial, and so on. And I don't think that's going to change. So I think what's going to happen is that America is going to continue to talk up its strategic contest with China, but do far too little to win it. And, and that can, and so I think there are two possibilities. The first is a continuation of what seemed to me to be the clear trends of the last a decade, including the last three years since 2017, which is that um, uh, China's influence continues to grow and America's influence continues to decline. Uh, because what because in, the, in in East Asia, because although lots of every country in East Asia is frightened of China, no country in East Asia wants to live under China's shadow. But no country in East Asia is willing to sign up to a new Cold War with China. America won't have the support it needs, and and as that as it America talks up its determination to confront China, but fails to perform, its credibility falls and its leadership erodes. And so that's one possibility. The other possibility is that any one of the issues that are, that are ticking along at the moment, and I think Taiwan is the most dangerous of them, does end up in a confrontation. Um, and in a confrontation, one of two things can happen. Uh, either America backs off that confrontation and its credibility in Asia, its leadership in Asia is destroyed almost overnight, or it doesn't back up from the con confrontation and America and China go to war. Now, I think that would be a, a, an unimaginable catastrophe uh, and extremely dangerous. But I, th but I think one thing is clear. America cannot win a war against China and attempting to do so would destroy American leadership in Asia very quickly. So one way or another, I, th I think it's very hard to see a future uh, in which the United States succeeds in preserving the strategic leadership in Asia it's exercised for so long. That is a great sadness to me uh, because I think American leadership has been very good for Asia and very good for Australia. But um, just because I like it doesn't mean it's going to happen. And I think what Australian policymakers and others need to do is to start recognising that probability 
and start conducting themselves accordingly. Uh, yeah, thank you for this for this comment. Uh, in Europe, there is a growing understanding of this uh, bad news, at least from one place to another, maybe not overall everywhere. But Europe has been slow recently to understand things, uh, that things are changing. Yes. Uh, but I can see already the rise of, uh, of understanding that this might be the final final uh, sort of end result, the end result yeah. of, this, uh, of this thing. Yeah, and of course, there are various uh, solutions proposed by France or Germany. They, they, they are on the opposing side of the you know, proposition how yeah. to approach that. Poland is completely lost <laughs> in, this, in this world that suddenly got broken. We, yes. we thought that we had arrived at the final destination, happy world. Yes. You know. And it turned out that the history has not ended, which is a really a major wake up. I mean, people have problems yes. with understanding this. Yes. Um, that's going to be a right then. Thank you very much. Uh, our guest was uh, Professor Hugh White. Uh, um, uh, stay with us. Uh, it was Strategy in Future, Jacek Bartosiak. And that was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.